to Green Road Church. Welcome to our gems. Welcome to families of the gems. Welcome to everyone. This is Gem Sunday. Yeah. Am I the only one excited around here? Or maybe I'm the only one who's had a lot of coffee this morning. Oh, what a great day to be in church. What a beautiful day to be celebrating our gems and the gems ministry. We, we welcome all of you. And we're going to begin this morning with an announcement that Catherine has about something coming up next week. Good morning. Good morning. So just a quick reminder that next week, Sunday, May 7th, is our VBS volunteer workshop. So if you have signed up to volunteer, please make sure that you can stay a little bit after the service next week, Sunday, so you can learn what's going to be happening um, and get comfortable with uh, what we're going to be doing at the beginning of June. Also, speaking of volunteers, we need some more. <laughs> so if you go out to the lobby, there's a beautiful poster that has different blank spaces that you can sign your name on to help us with BBS to bless the kids. Plus, kind of a cool thing, the reaching team has been... Um, uh, invited to be a part of this, the May first Friday, so the Friday that's coming up in downtown Goshen. So we're going to have a table where we're going to be having a game and passing out invitations to the VBS. So if you happen to be downtown Goshen uh, this Friday, take a look around, see if you see some familiar faces, possibly dressed up in medieval costumes. So <laughs> a little little info for you. We have, some. we have some. Oh, sweet. And do we know where the table's going to be? We don't know that yet. Okay. Maybe we could uh, send out an, a 
uh, email during the week so that people can come or down. Or check Facebook. We can put it on Facebook. There we go. So you can come down and support us at the First Fridays. Oh, praise God. Well, this is Gem Sunday. And uh, if you're not sure, if you're not sure what gems are, it's girls everywhere meeting the Savior. Used to be called Kelvinettes. I'm curious, how many people were Kelvinettes? Okay. We got a few, few Kel oh, all right, a few Kelvinettes here this morning. Uh, but gems are, uh, are, are the, the version, the, the new version of Kelvinettes, girls everywhere meeting the Savior. And so we're going to watch a short video telling us about the gems ministry. How will God's girls know that they belong and that they are loved? By hearing, knowing, understanding, and believing that the God who created and designed us is our truest friend. Because when girls understand that they are friended by God, it changes the way they friend one another. In a culture where young women are taught to trade precious friendships for popularity, authenticity for attention, and adoring God for a chance to be adored by the world, today's girls desperately need to be shown a better way. So we mentor them. We study the Bible. We pray with and for them. We bring them together in a supportive community and we point them to a faithful friend, Jesus. By following Jesus, they will become the kind of friends who love one another, serve one another, pray for one another, accept one another, and are kind to one another. And that's when God's girls will know they belong and they are loved. like to invite the gems to come on up and they're going to begin leading us in the gems litany this morning. So as they come up, invite everyone to stand in body or spirit as we join them in the gems litany. For 50 years, girls and women from generation to generation have been uniting their voices to recite Micah 6, 8 in their GEMS clubs, whether their club is in Canada, United States, Uganda, and 13 other countries, it sounds like this. GEMS and GEMS leader, what does the Lord require of us? To act justly, to have mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Micah 6, 8. This is who God is. I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. In grateful response to who he is and what he has done through us, Jesus, we act, love, and by just doing what is right. Blessed are those who act justly, who always do what is right. Psalm 106. We love mercy by serving one another with love and kindness and compassion. Serve one another in love. Galatians 6. Walk humbly with God by saying yes to God and walking in his way for our lives. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love. Ephesians 4, 2. Equipped with God's word and compelled by his love, these girls are making a difference as they act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Let's encourage them, pray for them, and join them. Because Micah 6.8 isn't just for girls and gems. It's for all. Are you ready? Boys and grown-ups, what does the Lord require of us? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Micah 6.8. Amen. our worship. Let's worship God together this morning. Yeah. 
the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for ever wandering hearts. Not because of who I am, not because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you tell me who I am. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes of see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice to calm the sea would call out the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a power quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a favor in the wind still you. Hear me when I'm falling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quick. Waiting here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still, you hear me when I'm falling, but you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Walk me, 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 walk me
One of the ways God shapes us is through ministries like GEMS and through our GEMS leaders and, and those who help teach us the Bible and teach us about God. That is God shaping us to become the people that he has created us to be. It's so wonderful to have you GEMS here this morning. And the God who shapes us into who he wants us to be is the God who greets us this morning. Receive God's greeting. Grace mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite the children, including the gems, to come on up for a children's message this morning. Good morning, Mikey. Good morning, Roy. Come on up. You can just have a seat along here. And, uh, yeah, we got something special going on this morning. So I hope you guys are ready to move. Ready to move a little bit. You guys like to move? I like to move. move. Hmm? No? Hey, you know what? Hey, guys. Good morning. Got room for you here? Come on down. Join, join the party. Hey, I'll tell you something this morning. Sometimes life can get pretty confusing, can it? You ever find times where you just don't know what to do? Maybe you're at school home, out at play, and just, I don't know what to do. That happens to me. And it can be kind of confusing sometimes. But thank God, thank God he gives us his word, the Bible. And the Bible is very clear about what we are supposed to do, right? In fact, we talked about it this morning, Micah 6, eight, Micah 6, eight. the theme verse for the gems we are to act justly. That means do what's right. Do what's right. We're to love mercy, which means we're to be kind. We're to be compassionate to others. We're, we're to help people who need our help. And we're to walk humbly with God, which means we realize we're no better than anyone else. And everybody we should meet, everybody we meet, we should treat them with respect. Right? So act justly, Love mercy, walk humbly with God. And you can apply that to any situation you're in. Any situation, at school, at home, at play, wherever you are, if you're not sure what to do, do those three things. And if you do those three things, you're going to be all right. Because that's what God tells us to do. Now, we need to really get that down deep in our hearts. Act justly love mercy, and walk humbly with God. So Catherine and Jessica are going to teach us some actions. So you guys need to stand okay, up. Yep, we need to 
We need everyone stand, stand up. up. Stand up. Stand up. We can take a step or two back. We're gonna stand we're gonna up. learn some actions here. All right. You guys ready? So yes, actions always help us remember things, and these three actions that God gives us in His Word are so important for us to know that we'll memorize them. So whenever you're doing something, you can think, ah. I know what to do, and maybe you can do this little move. You can say it in your head or out loud, and it'll help you. So I'm going to go over here. You can watch Jessica and me and Pastor Rick over there, too. And the I'm, congregation, I'm, I'm everyone it else, Don't look at me. I'm learning it. can learn it, too. So everyone needs to learn this. You will be tested. So it's going to start. I'm going to call it out. Micah 6, 8, and then hands on hips. Act justly, fist in palm. Do it with us here. Act justly. And then we're going to love, hands in front of heart, mercy. Show your mercy. There you go. Love, mercy. And then what we need to do is we need to walk. But how are we going to walk? We're going to walk humbly. Take a knee. Take a knee. And then we can look up and we can say, with, With God. God. All right, let's practice that? it. Let's practice go. it. If you get lost, look at Jessica. We'll right. do it two more times. Here we go. Here we go. Micah 6, uh, six eight. 8. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. With, With God. God. All right, let's do it one, one more time. time. Let's see if you got it. Here we go. Micah, Micah 6 8. Act justly. Love, mercy, walk humbly with, with God. God. There you go. All Give right. yourselves Good a job. round of applause. All right. You guys can go back to your seats. I feel like I should have the congregation do that. What was that? Micah 6, 8. Act justly. Love, mercy, walk humbly with God. Take my heart. 
That song was a prayer. I hope you didn't just sing it as a song, like a nice song, nice pretty song. It really was a prayer. Take my heart, form it. Take my mind and transform it. Take my will and conform it to yours, Lord. You know how that happens? Well, it's by the Holy Spirit, absolutely. But really, it's, it's, it's a lot more practical than you think. Because God has given us his word. And as we commit to living according to his word and actually doing what he tells us to do, that's how he transforms our hearts. That's how he transforms our minds. That's how he conforms our will to his. So, yes, it's by the Holy Spirit, but it's not like magic. How all of a sudden, bing, you know, oh, now I'm a person who my mind and my heart and my will are lined up with God's. It's wonderful. No, it happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't get me wrong about that. But it happens as we obey God's word. That's how he transforms us. And that's what today's message is about. Now, usually we just hear Micah 6, 8. That's the, the gems theme verse. And usually we just hear that, but I'm going to read a few of the verses before that so you understand the context of what the prophet Micah was trying to get across to the people of his day. So Micah chapter 6, starting at verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Praise God for his word. So what is the heart of worship? What is the heart of of worship. In other words, what, what pleases God? Because that's what we're trying to do in worship, isn't it? We're trying to please God. We're trying to bring delight to our Heavenly Father's heart. Remember, worship's not about us and what we want. A lot of people make worship about themselves and, and what they want. That's not what worship is about. True worship is about God and what he wants. And the people of Micah's day had forgotten what true worship was all about. They thought as long as they came to the temple and, and offered the right kind of sacrifices, then it didn't matter how they lived their lives the rest of the week. They acted like it didn't matter if they took advantage of the poor and the vulnerable. That it didn't matter if they were dishonest in their business dealings. It didn't matter if they treated the foreigners among them as second-class citizens, as long as they performed their religious duties. But it did matter. 
If you aren't loving your neighbor, then all that religious stuff is, is empty. As God said in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. To think that one can appease God, make God happy by, by offering the right sacrifices and not living the way he expects is idolatry. No matter how many rams or rivers of olive oil one offers, even if one offers their firstborn as a sacrifice, it means nothing. It's just a show. A show that does not impress God. Hashtag unimpressed. God is not some idol who we can manipulate through our acts of, of worship and sacrifice. Hey, God, I came to church and I sang your praises and, and I put money in the offering plate. So you got to do what I want you to do now. You got to answer my prayers. You got to give me what I want. That's idolatry. That's trying to manipulate God. And you can't manipulate God. God is, is not some idol. God is the living God who is far more interested in us living according to his commandments on a daily basis than putting on a show on Sunday. So Micah tells us what the heart of worship is, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. To help us understand the first part, to act justly, we're going to watch a short video from the Bible Project. So check this out. If you were a praying mantis, it would be socially acceptable to devour your mate. And if you're a honey badger, you have no regard for other animals. You don't care. If you're a panda with twins, it's normal to abandon one to take care of the other. But if humans do any of these things, we would call it wrong, unfair, or unjust. Yeah, why is that? Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that, but we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And so in the biblical story, we see this happening on a personal level, but also in families and then in communities and in whole civilizations that create injustice, especially towards the vulnerable. But the story doesn't end there. Out of this whole mess, God chose a man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was to teach his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Yeah, doing righteousness, that's a Bible word I don't really use, but what comes to mind is being a good person. But what does that even mean, being good? The biblical Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, and it's more specific. It's an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It's about treating others as the image of God. With the God-given dignity they deserve. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. Like here in the book of Proverbs, what does it mean to bring about just righteousness? Open your mouth for those who can't speak for themselves. And what do these words mean for the prophets like Jeremiah? Rescue the disadvantaged, 
and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And like here, look in the book of Psalms. The Lord God upholds justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and sets the prisoner free. But he thwarts the way of the wicked. Whoa, he thwarts the wicked? Yeah, in Hebrew, the word wicked is rasha. It means guilty or in the wrong. It refers to someone who mistreats another human, ignoring their dignity as an image of God. So justice and righteousness is a big deal to God. Yes, it's what Abraham's family, the Israelites, were to be all about. They ended up as immigrant slaves, being oppressed unjustly in Egypt. And so God confronted Egypt's evil, declaring them to be rasha, guilty of injustice. And so he rescued Israel. But the tragic irony of the Old Testament story is that these redeemed people went on to commit the same acts of injustice against the vulnerable. And so God sent prophets who declared Israel guilty. But they weren't the only ones. There's injustice everywhere. Yeah, some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others receive benefits or privileges from unjust social structures they take for granted. And sadly, history has shown that when the oppressed gain power, they often become oppressors themselves. So we all participate in injustice, actively or passively, even unintentionally. We're all the guilty ones. And so this is the surprising message of the biblical story. God's response to humanity's legacy of injustice is to give us a gift, the life of Jesus. He did righteousness and justice, and yet he died on behalf of the guilty. But then God declared Jesus to be the righteous one when he rose from the dead. And so now Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that they too can be declared righteous before God, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus did for them. The earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness from God, not just as a new status, but as a power that changed their lives and compelled them to act in surprising new ways. Yeah, if God declared someone righteous when they didn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. This is a radical way of life, and it's not always convenient or easy. It's courageously making other people's problems my problems. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Hey, this is John and Tim from The Bible Project. Thanks for watching this video. This was a theme video where we take one biblical motif and trace it from beginning to end. We also do a lot of other videos you can find here on our YouTube channel. The Bible Project is a nonprofit animation studio and we're crowdfunded, which means you can help us make the next videos. You can find more information at our website, thebibleproject.com. I like that line. Justice is courageously making other people problems your own. As mentioned in the video, doing justice means speaking up for those who don't have the power to speak up for themselves, like Esther. You guys know about Queen Esther? Because I heard that you studied the life of Esther this year. And Esther had to do justice by speaking up for her people when the time came. Now she could have played it safe, kept quiet. Instead, she risked her life to appear before the king to plead for the lives of her people. And because she did, her people weren't slaughtered. I mean, imagine if Esther wouldn't have said anything. How many men, how many women, how many children, how many babies would have been killed? Well, thankfully, Esther said yes to God. And her people live. The very people through whom the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, would come from. See, doing justice involves speaking up for those who are in vulnerable situations. Like at school. Have you ever seen some kids picking on someone else at school? Yeah. When I grew up going to school, there was a lot of that that went on. Maybe somebody was different. Maybe they didn't fit in. Maybe 
Maybe it was because of, the, of their clothes. And so other kids, mean kids, would be picking on them. Well, what do we do in that situation? Do we, do we ignore it? Do we look the other way? Just be thankful it's not happening to us? To do justice means to speak up for that person. To, to stick up for them. To, to stand with them so that they're not alone. That's what justice is. It's risky. It takes courage. But remember, Jesus once said, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. That's justice. And along with doing justice, acting justly, we're supposed to love mercy. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated as mercy is chesed. Let me hear you say that. Chesed. You got to get the, you got to get that back throat thing going. Chesed. It's an incredibly rich concept. It includes mercy, but it's, it's so much more. That's why it can be translated many different ways. Chesed can be translated love. It can be translated loyal love, unfailing love, goodness, faithfulness, and mercy. Chesed is about being kind and compassionate and helping those who are in need. Chesed is a love that you can depend on. It's like if you have a friend that you can call up at 2 o'clock in the morning because you are in trouble, and they're going to come. They're not going to question it. They're going to come, and they're going to help you. That is chesed. Now, the Bible Project has another short video, and I think they do such a great job of explaining it, just like justice. We're going to watch a, another short video about chesed. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this fourth phrase, loyal love. It translates the Hebrew word chesed, which is hard to translate into any language because it combines the ideas of love, generosity, and enduring commitment all into one. Chesed describes an act of promise-keeping loyalty that is motivated by deep personal care. Like in the story of Ruth, Ruth is a foreigner married to an Israelite man, but tragically her husband dies along with his brother and his father. All Ruth has left is her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi, who has nothing to give her. Naomi tells Ruth she should go back to her people, but instead, Ruth promises to stay by Naomi's side and take care of her. And as other people watch Ruth keep this promise over time, they call it an act of chesed. Notice that Ruth's chesed is not conditional or based on Naomi's worth. Rather, it's an expression of Ruth's character. She just is a generous and loving person who keeps her word. That's chesed. Now, Ruth's loyal love is truly inspiring, but the one who shows the most enduring chesed in the Bible is God. Like in the story about Jacob, who is a treacherous liar even to his own family. But despite that, God chooses him and repeats the promise he made to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, that he would have a huge family through whom God would restore his blessing to the nations. And so 20 years later, when Jacob realizes how undeserving he is, he says to God, I'm not worthy of all the chesed you've shown me. And he's right. But God's chesed was never about Jacob's worth in the first place. It's a display of God's generous loyalty to his promise. God's chesed continues into the story of Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. When they're enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt, we're told that God remembered his promise to Abraham and Jacob, so God defeats Egypt and raises up Moses to liberate the people and lead them into the promised land. And in the story, this is called an act of chesed because it was about God keeping his word. Now, on their way to the promised land, the Israelites are scared of the nations around them and they doubt that God can protect them. So the people threaten to kill Moses and appoint a new leader to take them back to Egypt. God is understandably hurt and angry, but Moses steps in and says, forgive the sin of these people because of your great chesed. Notice that Moses asked God to forgive, not because the people deserve it, but because it's consistent with God's own character. And God agrees, and he recommits himself to a people that don't want to be committed to him. 
In the Bible, God is loyal and loving for no other reason than it's just who God is. Of course he wants his people to respond with chesed in return, but even when they don't, God's chesed remains. The prophet Hosea compared Israel's chesed to a morning mist that's here one moment and gone the next. But God's chesed is enduring. Like in the celebration of Psalm 136 that opens by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, and then 26 times repeats, his chesed is forever. And so, after centuries of Israel betraying their commitment to God, and after humanity's long history of violence and death, God still kept his promise in a dramatic and drastic way by becoming human and binding himself to us in the person of Jesus. And the people who followed Jesus of Nazareth said that in him they encountered the God of Israel who is full of loyal love and faithfulness. Jesus is the ultimate loyal and loving human. And in his life, death, and resurrection, God opened up a new future for all of us and for all of creation. And God did this because it's just who God is, generous, loving, and eternally loyal to his promises. And when we experience the purity and power of God's loyal love shown through Jesus, it compels us to reimagine why and how we can show chesed back to God and to the people around us. This is what it means to say that God is overflowing with loyal This year, the gems made cards from members of our congregation. Maybe you receive one. Cards to encourage people in their faith and to encourage them to let people know their love. That's chesed. Another thing the gems did was they made uh, jars to collect money in that went to that money went to supporting the World Renew uh, Animal Project, the, where we bought the farm animals and bought the bikes for people in poorer countries. The gems made those jars to, to collect money for that. That's, that's hesed. That's doing kindness for others. Recently, I talked to a woman who has cancer, really struggling, really suffering with it. And she, it's just amazing to talk to this woman because she doesn't dwell on the bad stuff that's happening in her life, even though she's going through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. She, she looks for the good stuff. And she was telling me about this woman who comes and helps her with cleaning, helps her do her laundry, help take her to doctor's appointments. And when this woman recently went into the hospital, her helper was able to go to her apartment and get some of the things that she needed from home and brought that to her in the hospital. That, that is chesed. And while I talked to this woman, she told me that her friend, her helper, is a real gem. And I thought, oh, that's, that's, that's appropriate for this Sunday. Because that's what gems do. That's what, that's what Tina and Benita and Jan have been teaching you how, what to do is to be kind and to be compassionate towards others, showing them kindness, helping people when we have that opportunity. Not out of some religious duty, no, but out of love. See, we're, we're not just supposed to like chesed. We're supposed to love Chesed, which means we're supposed to look for opportunities to show Chesed. You know, too often we go through life just focused on ourselves, but to love Chesed means you're looking for those opportunities where you can show it. Sweet! I get to show Chesed today. And you get excited about it. And remember, God loves a cheerful giver. And in order to live like this, we have to be humble, which is the third thing. Micah tells us we need to do. We have to be humble enough to, to look for ways to serve rather than to look for ways to be served. Walking humbly with God. I once read that true humility is not thinking less of yourself. 
True humility is thinking of yourself less. Did you catch that? Some people, they, they think being humble is about, you know, oh, I'm no good, I'm not that, you know, putting themselves down. That's not humility. Humility is about thinking about other people more than yourself. It's not about putting yourself down. It's about lifting others up. When I think about examples of humility, I think about nurses. I don't know. I know we have some nurses in the congregation. But I, when I think about nurses, I think about humility because nurses have to do things that are pretty humble. They have, we have, they have to take care of people in the hospital. That's, that's doing some things that are pretty humble, things that other people don't want to do. But they do them anyway. See, walking humbly with God, and I know that you gems talked about this this year, it's about saying yes to God's commandments. And sometimes God asks us to do things in his word that we may not want to do, but we do them anyway because we want to do what God requires. As Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. And God's will is for us to be humble. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4 defines humility as the fear of the Lord. The proud, they, they don't fear the Lord. Instead, they think they know better than God. And, and because of that, they just do whatever they want. You know, God says, take care of the poor. Well, I'm not going to take care of the poor. This is my money. I'm going to keep my money, and I'm going to make more money because I want to get rich. And God says, no, the reason I'm blessing you giving you financial blessing, is so that you can take care of the poor. It's not for yourself. It's so that you can share it with others. And when we get proud and think that we know better than God, well, that often leads to sin. And sin is the breaking of God's commandments. And it's a crime of which we're all guilty. There's not one person sitting in here, including myself, that's not guilty of sin. And for that, we deserve to be condemned. Knowing that should keep us humble. Knowing that should remind us that we're no better. We're no better than anyone else. Thankfully, God shows favor to the humble. Because God is, is merciful and, and full of hesed. He doesn't give us what we deserve, but he gives us grace through Jesus Christ. As we read in James 2.13, mercy triumphs over judgment. God would much rather show mercy than show judgment. And, and Jesus, he showed us God's chesed by humbling himself to become a human, to become a servant, and going to the cross to shed his blood for our sin, fulfilling God's justice so that we could be forgiven. That's why we can't earn God's favor or forgiveness through our sacrifices. See, that's the danger of what happens to a lot of Christians. They start doing good things, they start giving great offerings away, and they begin to think that somehow they're better than other people, that somehow God's going to love them because of all the good things they're doing, as though they're, they're getting points with God. And then they begin to start getting pride, prideful, thinking that they were self-righteous. <sighs> Through Jesus Christ, God's own Son, the ultimate sacrifice has been made. That's why we can't give any more sacrifices that earn God's favor because Jesus Christ earned God's favor on our behalf. And the only thing we can do to be right with God is to humble ourselves, to bow our knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. As we read in Psalm 51, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. That's 
why Micah tells us to walk humbly with God. See, that's humility. That's the heart of worship. And out of gratitude for what God has done for us, we worship Him. Out of gratitude for what God has done for us, we obey His commandments. Not to earn His favor, doesn't make us any better than anyone else, but it's because we're so full of thankfulness for what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. That's the heart of worship. May God help us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Can you come up and do those motions one more time? I'm going to do it one more time. Just because I think that's really good. So Micah 6, 8, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us your word to guide us in this life. Lord, forgive us for all the times we don't obey your commandments. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that we can't earn that forgiveness. Lord, all we can do is receive it by trusting in Jesus Christ. Lord, please fill us with so much gratitude that we want to obey you, that we want to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing the heart of worship. Some of the lyrics are, I'll bring you more than a song. God wants our hearts. Let's worship him with our whole hearts this morning.
and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. And the God who loves you deeply is the God who blesses you. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.